Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to day two of the playoffs for the Vulcan Deck Masters Season 1. My name is Frodan, and today I'm joined by Brian Kibler, who also is joined by his dog Shiro, who is overwatching him. Brian, how's it going? Doing really well. How about you, Dan? I'm going. I'm doing okay. I actually visited uh, Raynad yesterday. That's why my background might look familiar to some Raynad enthusiasts. I uh, ended up sleeping over and, and hanging out a little bit. We're going to go hit the beach later on. That's why I'm also in beach gear. You know, people are like... You know, why, why are you without glasses? You know, why are you wearing solid color shirts and not a, you know, a, a tie and a shirt? That's yeah, I look way fancier than you do. Jeez. You know, I got yeah, no. Although this, this shirt actually is missing a button in the bottom, so I really can't yeah. wear it out anywhere, but I can wear it when I'm sitting down in a broadcast because no one can tell, gotcha, even though gotcha. I told everyone. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that also the, the second button is loosened too, so it gave a little some fan service to me, Kibler. It's very nice and kind of you. I say? <laughs> <laughs> you aim to please, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about us, or sorry, less about us and more about the tournament itself. No, 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 let's Today, talk about us. I like talking about Okay, me. well, I mean, let's talk about our second favorite topic. It's Hearthstone and, and tournaments. Um, we're here to present the other half to find out who's going to be the grand finals number two. Yesterday, we saw Cypher from Fate to Karma go all the way to the grand finals, and today we're going to do very much of the same thing. We have five matches planned for you, uh, and all of them are best of five. I know in the past, in the group stages... Uh, Gilbert, you were playing in it as well. Uh, it was best of three conquest. Uh, today we're going to go into best of five conquest, starting with Strife Grove versus Orange. Yeah, this this first matchup is you know two of probably the, the most well known players uh, in the uh, remaining in the in the tournament. Uh, you know, Orange obviously from Archon and Strife Grove from Cloud Nine. Uh, both of them advanced from their group stages and are here facing off against one another. Yeah, that's right. So what they have to do is uh, Strife Crow will face off against Orange. Then we have Forzen versus Toyta, followed by Surrender versus, uh, you know, the winner of the first match, and then Trump versus the winner of the second match. Um, this is how we can stagger it so the playoffs will make sure to seed correctly. And then in the end, our fifth match will be a semifinal number two. So if a couple of players that people are familiar with, some of them uh, maybe not as familiar with, like Surrender, who was over in Korea, versus Toyta over in Germany. We're going to start things off um, with a Warlock versus... The warrior here, and it looked like it was the patron warrior from Orange, unless uh, Control Warrior got some real major facelifts last <laughs> time I checked. And uh, this is actually a pretty bad hand from Orange to start. Uh, he has you know, the Grimash that you only really want to see toward the end of the game. Uh, and then a bunch of enablers, but none of his tools to really dig deeper into his deck. Uh, Orange here, well, Deathspite is the most important card, so it's a nice, nice pickup on turn one. But he's really looking to find some ways to, to dig deeper into his deck, to find more of his combo elements. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, you want to get the, the card draws early on, so that way you can cycle through. And coincidentally, some of the card draw um, is also help you stabilize on the board. It gives you something to play as opposed to just armor up pass. Weapons are another form of making sure that your hand count stays high. You're not expending too many resources. Uh, but in some cases, uh, you know, your opponent won't be doing much either. It's a very... I mean, take a look at the Warlock deck for Strife Crow. Uh, we're, we don't see enough damning evidence to just pin it on being handlocked, for example. But um, we've been seeing a lot of more defensive Warlocks come out compared to some of the aggressive Zoos over the past month or so that's also been appearing. I mean, looking at Strife Ghost Hand, it's pretty clear that he is a very defensively oriented Warlock deck. We don't see any Giants, but so maybe it's some sort of Demon Lock hybrid. Um, the Twilight Drake there, obviously one of the defining cards of, of the handlock style, since it could come out really, really big <laughs> thanks to Life Tap. I do think that Strife Crows also really like the Maligos Warlock deck that's been starting, you know, continuing to rise in popularity ever since about a month, a month and a half ago at Dreamhack Summer. Um, and, and I'm not sure what your take is on that deck because I know it's a different style of combo decks. And when combo decks coll uh, collide, it's often, you know, very amusing for people who've been playing card games for a long time in terms of interaction and whatnot. I, mean, I, I like the Malagos, uh, the Malagos Warlock deck. I think it's pretty cool, the fact that it's able to take advantage of some of the Dragon Synergy cards. Uh, though, it, Strife Crow's head right now, given that he has Sun Fury Protector, that's, that's a, usually, a, that end and Sylvanas is usually a pretty big tell uh, for Handlock rather than Malagos. And we see the Ancient Watcher picked up. So, you know, it looks much more like a pretty traditional, uh, pretty traditional Handlock deck. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see for now. In the meantime, dropping the Twilight Drake, one of the best threats against Warrior that only has access to executes or multiple weapon hits. And that's often what the Warrior has to resort to doing because, you know, how else are you going to efficiently remove this without dedicating a lot? Now, what's also interesting, too, is that if he thinks this is a handlock deck, 
I know the Frothing Berserker has been often viewed as the card that's important to not necessarily just throw out there because you need that damage to end the game if you're going to try to burst your opponent out, assuming that they can put threat after threat and you can't answer it. I mean, one of the best ways for the patron deck to beat Handlock is really the, the, the one turn kill. You know, being able mm -hmm. to assemble a, a huge Frothing Berserker thanks to Whirlwind effects, an abort full of taunts, execute the big taunts, then just get in there with Frothing. So Here, Orange has deployed his Frothing Berserker early, um, which is going to make it harder for him to necessarily set that up. The fact that, that the Warlock decks have access to both Shadow Flame and Hellfire frequently makes it so that it's difficult to win with sort of the fill the board with Patriots plan. Oh, yeah. Um... I mean, the, the Pagans still have their own threat of damage. If you can get an Inner Rage and Whirlwind, you can still do, you know, upwards to 12 to 15 damage, but it's not like the 30 or, you know, sometimes 60 damage that looks really appealing on the Frothing Berserker end. Um, and in this case, Orange is again draining some resources here to try to stabilize the board, but uh, if his opponent had Hellfire, he'd be in a lot of trouble. So he has to be very cautious to navigate this because if he's, if he's losing too much of his resources, he just can't win the game. And here he's able to set up four patrons, but his board is extremely vulnerable to a board wipe effect. And we see from Strifecrow's hand, if he wants, he can Ancient Watcher Shadow Flame this board next turn. Uh, that will end up eliminating everything that Orange has in play. But from Orange's perspective, he doesn't really have much going on in his hand. You know, he doesn't he didn't really have the opportunity to sort of sit back because he had no battle rages, no acolytes. He couldn't really try and sit back and assemble something bigger. He's kind of in the position where he just sort of has to hope that Strifecrow doesn't have it. Yeah, yeah, I can understand I that, understand too, that considering too. that he has Gromash as well. Gromash is another way you can continue to finish in case um, he had opportunities in the next few turns to really pressure for it. But in this scenario, he gets shut down completely. And, you know, Strife was in a position where he can also continue to answer threats, and he still has his own threats of his own. Sylvanas and Emperor Thorson need to be dealt with by the warrior as well. Well, there's another Grim Patron, so... Orange now is potentially in the position to uh, to start building up another big board. He can't really play it out right now. I mean, he could play it in Whirlwind, but that doesn't do too much at the moment. I mean, yeah, not really. this is not a great use for the slam either. Well, so, uh, I mean, uh, what, what's the rush here, Kibler? I mean, sometimes you feel like this Warlock deck can give you some time as well. Um, they're going to be playing big threats. I mean, he's playing as if uh, there's a need to always have something on the board. When I, al I always see that patrons, when they're when, when players are really good at this deck, one of their biggest criticisms of other players when they're watching is that they feel like they're too impatient sometimes. And you know, well, sometimes you just need to pass and let your opponent do whatever they want. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some people who say that the, the warrior hero power of armor up doesn't really do too much for the patron deck uh, compared to the effectiveness of hero powers in some other classes. But the fact that it allows the patron combo deck to just sort of sit back and armor up and extend its, its life total, uh, mm -hmm. give it more time to build up, uh, you know, build up a hand, build up a board, uh, it really goes a long way toward in increasing its effectiveness in a lot of matchups. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, uh, now looks like Shrefu can start putting out his own threats. Emperor Thorsten is just one of the best when, you ha when you're playing this Warlock or defensive Warlock because you're able to tap for more cards. Um, in this case, I think he's just he's really happy with being able to drop it and knows his opponent can't deal with it easily. I mean, Thorsten, whether, whether you're playing combo or normal handlock, just the, the cost reduction is a really big deal. Uh, getting the, the, the ability to... Uh, play your spells for cheaper is is great when you're, you're able to c burst combo someone out. And if Strifecore were playing Malagos, he does have double Dark Bomb that are cost reduced. Uh, right. But even just in a normal handlock deck, the ability to gain enough uh, sort of mana discount to play multiple things in a turn when normally you'd only be able to play one expensive card is a really big deal. All right. Well, Orange gets finally one of his card draw mechanisms, but is it? too late to truly benefit off of it and too defensive because sometimes in these pinch scenarios you slam like your acolyte and draw a couple of cards or in this case he might even try to opt to draw cards so he can kill off this Emperor Thorson as a priority hmm. Hmm. that war song is an interesting draw I don't think that it's necessarily what he's looking for but he is able to potentially set up yeah, a bo another board full of, uh, of patrons here with the attack coin whirlwind. So now he's going to have four patrons. 
And uh, this does potentially put Strife Crow in a position where he needs to find a uh, some sort of mass removal effect. But we know that Strife Crow has the double discounted Dark Bomb in his hand, which uh, can at least deal with some of those right now. Yeah. Zero cost coil, one cost Dark Bomb on two of them, and then trade in with uh, with Emperor if he really wants to. Even he could even play because of the mana discount uh, the Twilight Drake. And oh no, he actually can't play quite play Twilight Drake and both Dark Bombs and Defender. He's one he's one mana off being able to do that. Yeah, um, but at the same time, I don't know if he feels the burden to remove all of them. If there's only one and there's like a big wall of minions that he can't get past, it still serves the same purpose effectively. I mean, having having a a single uh, patron in play, especially when he knows that Orange has already used both copies of Whirlwind. It's not nearly as uh, imposing a, uh, a, a potential threat. And he could even, if he wants to, taunt up just the Twilight Drake with this Sunfear Protector and potentially even protect Thoris in for an additional turn. And that's what he's going to do. Yeah, I like this play because if your opponent had Execute, you know, there's still the fact that he removes Thoris from the end of trading. Okay. But, um, I'm a little surprised by that, but... I think he just wants to eliminate any possibility of your opponent being able to execute and get past it, and then ha by some miracle of a chance have exactly a way to copy a Grim Patron, benefit off killing the Sun Fury, and then continuing the, <laughs> the train of patrons. I mean, I've seen that a lot of times where people are like, well, even this patron should be okay up against a Sludge Belcher, and then they execute the Sludge Belcher and the one two comes out and the, tr you know, the, the whole thing becomes... Yeah. I suppose it is, it is a matter of what can possibly go wrong from this scenario. And, you know, granted, Strifer was already sort of at the rope and didn't necessarily have a window to, to you know, potentially think through, okay, well, there's two Whirlwinds yeah. and an Inner Rage gone. How likely it is that something actually happens here? The Orange does have several cards in his hand, uh, so it's entirely possible he has been sitting on that execute. Yeah, we know it's Gromash, which has been cycled out. Um, I'm not sure how you feel about Gromash being cycled out, but I often miss him in some scenarios, especially if the game goes longer. I know you don't often get the chance to play him considering how heavy he is, but um, you know, I, I don't mind occasionally seeing the Gromash in patron decks. I don't know if you have an opinion about him. Uh, I mean, I, I like the fact that Gromash actually gives you the ability to win games when your opponent is able to answer the rest of your combo. Uh, in, in many cases, your, your opponent will spend a lot of resources dealing with your patrons and Frothing Berserker, or maybe you know, so try and keep a really small board so it's difficult for you to actually get a big burst with Frothing. And the fact that Gromash individually generates so much damage is uh, you know, really valuable in those games where the rest of your deck isn't able to operate. Yeah, for sure. I mean, sometimes you just need more damage for the card. You, know, you, you don't need to draw five cards in order to kill your opponent, you just need to draw one. Um, not in this scenario, though. I mean, I think he's he's definitely going to be reaching pretty hard. Battle Rage into another Battle Rage is <laughs> it's not really what you're looking for. You just rather have the card as removal. And Harrison Jones is one of those tech cards that was played around for a while in Patron. I know a f only a very few people were trying even cards like Brawl to win the mirror or bounce back against really dominating boards. Um, but that didn't even really catch on. So I have a hard time imagining um, Orange being able to come back here, considering that he's dug through a significant portion of his deck already. Yeah, I mean, Orange has used a lot of his most powerful tools for enabling big turns as well. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, the fact that he's already used both Whirlwinds puts him in a position where it's really difficult for him to even generate sort of that, that big frothing Berserker kill. Uh, he also doesn't have anything right. discounted from Emperor or anything like that. So he's limited significantly on even just the number of uh, of cards he'll be able to play in a turn by his mana. This is 17... Uh, yeah, 17 damage this turn. Unfortunately, a little bit off. Doesn't have the mana for lethal, guys. Chill. <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. If he had Jaraxxus and the Defender, it would have been it. But I think he'll he just go ahead he and settle. He had Chat Lethal, but not actual Lethal. Yes. Well, I, only, I mean, that's... that's Ooh. Cool. Basically lethal, anyways. It's, it's, seeing the shield block in Orange's deck is, is pretty interesting here. That's a uh, a choice that a number of players have made to improve the patrons' uh, matchup against aggressive decks by giving you a little bit more cycle and a little bit more ability to uh, to preserve your life total. Um, and some of them even have shield slam in addition to that. I'm curious to see if if uh, Orange's deck has gone down that road entirely. 
Yeah, I think uh, we've seen some players really explore the idea of even splitting. You know, Tiddler, for example, won Dream Hack by having one shield block, one armor smith, and then like a slam. So he kind of had a weird mix, so that way he'd be pretty good against aggro while still being able to cycle through aggressively. Uh, I know some people were cutting like some of those early game cards, like Unstable Ghoul, and all of a sudden it becomes core again based off how the meta changes. So Patron's even evolving itself. I know some people might be like, well... You know, maybe it's just the same exact thing. It's Grim Patient Clears or Fathering Ber Berserker OTKs. But there's still small innovations happening within the class that I think people should pay attention to. Speaking of small innovations, look at Strifeco's hand right now. He has Revenge. Revenge is a card that uh, it's it's seen some play, but not a ton. Um, yeah. And the fact that it is, at some points in the game, actually able to effectively whirlwind for three can clear an entire board of Grim Patrons. And, uh, you know, that can certainly be a big deal. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's not even just necessarily that just the patrons, too, that might be useful. Um, you know, sometimes against patrons or other things, um, you know, the Falling Berserkers aren't exactly always at 4 HP. In fact, it's usually 3 or less because it takes a Whirlwind effect or two. Um, so you should be able to clear almost effectively anything that the Grim Patron puts out. And that revenge can be pretty huge. And it often is um, a way for you to stabilize the board early on or in the mid game because. You can see that he has greedy cards in his deck like Ysera. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that he's playing cards like Blackwing Corruptor. I know some Dragon Warriors have fallen disenchanted by that deck. They're not as high as it um, compared to they used to be. But I I'm looking forward to see how this deck operates. Like I, I think it has a good mix of some of that late game power. And I want to see if that card Revenge is going to be useful here. I mean, the, one, the one scary thing about Revenge is when you're enabling it, you're almost dead. And, you know, yes, you could have potentially have low health and a lot of armor, um, but in particular against uh, against Patron, which can assemble a lot of damage very quickly, uh, it can be a little bit scary to be in that low of a life range. Yeah, it's true. Twelve is not ex exactly the safest amount, especially nowadays. Almost every deck has some sort of burst around that range, twelve to sixteen. Uh, that it's very easy generated to end the game. In fact, I know Reyna was telling me that uh, he feels like that's what qualifies you to be an elite top tier deck nowadays. You have to have some kind of burst or other. I mean, I, I think that I think that that's a huge part of that is because of the nature of the combo decks, like Malagos, like Grim Patron, sort of like Handlock. It's if you are trying to just play a sort of a control game and attrition your opponent out. There's so many decks that have. Either of these powerful one-turn kill combinations that you need to be able to, to stop that there really aren't the tools to handle uh, decisively, mm -hmm. uh, or decks that, that have you know just o totally overpowering attrition mechanisms like Jaraxxus out of Handlock or just Life Tap out of Handlock if you're sure, uh, sure. dealing with you know, non-Warlock classes. <laughs> or Giants on turn four with Handlock. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I, I, I think it. Life Tap is the, is the biggest reason that that's true, by the way. That, that Classes fundamentally need to have burst mechanisms because otherwise they're not going to be able. They either have to be very aggressive, or have a way to burst uh, warlock decks down because they can't possibly beat life tap going long. Yeah, which certainly makes it interesting for future design. You know, like will we ever see a really good one mana minion out of warlock again? So that way, like life tap becomes insane. But. You know, as we digress uh, with that conversation, it looks like the warrior here from Strifeco has been able to stabilize really well, and a lot has to do with things like the early weapons, and that's been a, such a key proponent here for warrior to stabilize, uh, and that's one of the key matchups to win, or key to this matchups to win for the control warrior. Yeah, the, the control warrior really wants to be able to deal with you know the the early game of the uh, of the patron deck without really taking too much damage. We do see that revenge come up now, so. You know, maybe if Strifeco had taken a little bit more damage and been able to get a little bit more armor, it could have gone better for him. But uh, but here, you know, he's he's really in a great position. It, he he doesn't he hasn't really seen too much on uh, on Orange's side of the board that has has caused him much trouble. And he's getting to the late game where he can really start to leverage his powerful cards. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, actually, I, I'm wondering about what happened. We just what what we just saw, in fact, um, because I think. Orange is not happy with what he was reducing in cost of Emperor Thorson, so he chose to hold it when most people in turn six would slam it, right? So uh, in this case, I, he was I, searching for something else. His hand his hand actually seems like a pretty reasonable hand to, to Emperor, but it's possible that, that... No, I guess I was actually just looking and trying to figure out if, if Strike had the coin. He didn't, because you know, it's possible that he would want to you know not let his opponent be able to cast... Uh, 
Well, actually, no, he already had five armor. Plus, he was just trying to avoid it just getting shield slammed to death. Because Strike Girl had mm -hmm. shield blocked. I'm just trying to figure this out real quick. Because right. Strike had shield blocked, uh, he would be able to just remove it for one mana. And that, uh, and we're going to see that now. We're just going to see Sylvanas come down and then shield slam, take out the, the Emperor. Oh, no, he's actually a shield slam. Ah, even better. Shield slam to yep. Sylvanas. Just take, take it. And, that, and if Orange had played his Emperor last turn, this wouldn't have been a line of play available to Strife Crow. So it's, it's yeah. interesting to see how mm. he's trying to be a little bit more conservative with his Emperor and actually gets, ends up getting kind of punished for oh, it. Oh, man. Yeah, and some of the really important cards, like the Father and Berserker, are not reduced in cost. Um, the Whirlwind and the, the, Fra the Warsong Commander, though, is extremely valuable to the combination of the Grim Patron Warrior. But in this scenario, well, it starts getting a little awkward. We can see we can potentially see Warsong frothing whirlwind execute battle rage. Though currently Orange isn't himself damaged, so the battle rage will only actually draw two cards. Oh, you're, that's such a good point too. Like not being able to draw that extra card oh, is no. really paramount because that extra card dug deeper might be your key to success to turning this matchup around. You might pick up something that impacts the board, the second frothing, or if, you know, you have Harrison Jones in this matchup for other things like the, the warrior classes in the matchups, and that helps a lot. Oh man. Dropping Gromash here. Is not good. Interesting. Is this going to Gromash attack execute? What it looks like he's doing. Okay. So now he's leaving him... Using his, his Grimash leaves him with a little bit less burst, but Grimash is a, a card that in this matchup is frequently going to you know, get executed, get big game huntered, and in particular when your deck is otherwise not, not very vulnerable to those, you're looking to set up you know, the really big turns where you're actually just sending your Frothing Berserker uh, in for 10 damage at once. But this is actually ended up horrible for Orange. He, is, you know, he loses his, yeah. his Grimash immediately, and then is just facing Alex Straza to the face. Yeah, and then, I mean, people were thinking maybe you can set up Ysera for like insane card advantage, and if that was a control matchup, maybe so, but there is a possible lethal here coming out for the next turn on Strife Goes Behalf if his opponent can't deal with the Alex Straza here. He even has, he even has Grimash Revenge, which, mm -hmm. I, yeah, if, if Alex Straza, if Alex Straza dies, he, he's one off from being able to, hit, to play Death Spite. I guess he couldn't play Death Spite plus Grimash and Enrage at the same turn. But yeah, it, it looks like Orange is just dead here. If he well, I mean, never say never. He can draw with Battle Rage now. <laughs> oh, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, he, he is now suddenly very damaged from being that at all <laughs> last turn. But it seems, I mean, it seems mm. unlikely that he's going he's gonna to find a way to survive here. He needs to, whoa, Death Spite. That's Death Spite. Mm, yeah, I would, I would like to see him see if he can draw an answer first. Or maybe he thinks that his, his hand is so poor and his chances of drawing removal is so unlikely because he already used one revenge or one execute that he might as well just go aggressive too. I mean, Which, yeah, this is, this is really aggressive. <laughs> and he puts himself dead to any card. Like, he's dead to Grimash, he's dead to Death Spite. Well, he, he wouldn't be dead to just Death Spite because his opponent would he'd still be living with 2 HP, but in sure. this scenario, it was like Gromash plus Cool. Like, if it was just Cool Taskmaster plus Death Spite, then he'd die. Yeah, yeah. He's, he was yeah, dead to a whole lot of things. For some reason, I saw the 12 and didn't see the, uh, didn't see the, uh, the, the, the armor, but yes. No, I, your point still stands. It's like the fact is he was not in a good spot. If his opponent had any single two-card combination that improved damage, he would have died completely. Uh, but I think, you know, he went for that, like, that... 0.5% chance to win as opposed to like a 0% chance to to potentially just survive a little bit. If you like suicide there's, problem, for example. Yeah, there, there, I mean, there's, there's, there's some argument that say, you know, says, okay, well, if my opponent has basically anything good, I'm going to lose here. So I want to try and set myself for a position where I can actually potentially still win the game as opposed mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, as opposed to putting himself in a position where he's just trying not to lose. Yeah, yeah. And trying not to lose rarely works out um it, from at least anecdotally like i can't really give you statistics like firebat could off of spreadsheets but you know <laughs> just t talking based off of casting and seeing a bunch of times players be really defensive and conservative they often miss their window of being able to come back some people might say like well you know you could have threw in your fathering berserkers or like pushed out a bunch of grim patrons and draw and try to win but you're giving up your win conditions directly and you're drawing to the end of the deck which doesn't give you any more answers they just help you draw more cards in that scenario yeah, absolutely. 
So this, now we see Orange play, playing uh, Hunter against Striker also playing Hunter. And uh, we, we are playing a best of five here. So both I believe both players know their opponent's classes. And I, I, Orange knew that he was going up yes. against Striker as Hunter. And it looks like he felt that his Hunter was the best ch uh, the best chance to, uh, to pick up mm -hmm. the game here. It makes sense, too, considering that from the glimpse of what we saw, we had Orange with Chargers in his decks, like the Arcane Golems. And then Strifeco has a more defensive approach with the Houndmasters. And normal logic dictates that the more aggressive Hunter is the one that's favored, although we have seen mid-range Hunter be able to whip out some nice comebacks. And Houndmasters is one of those important cards. The more taunts you can get, the more you can fight back for the board. Yeah, Generally speaking, the Hunter deck that's able to be a bit more aggressive and actually get to lean on its hero power is the one that tends to be more successful in the Hunter Mirror matches. Uh, when you're playing defensively and trying to play more individually powerful cards like Savannah High Main, uh, you end up not being able to deal with your opponent's board and don't get to use your hero power at the same time. So, ooh, and this is pretty This is pretty big. The Misha, but also missing with the dive jump. Mm, yeah, because then a lot of things become activated. Um, if there was a weapon or there's some kill command, then all of a sudden the math would be a little more complicated and a higher chance for knife juggler to survive or your opponent can't get past. But in this scenario, uh, that ended up working out okay. It still may go poorly for Orange here because Strife Crow does have... Now he picked up a quick shot, so he can even quick shot and uh, play a web spinner and trade in with both, giving him an active trap and clearing Orange's board. Yes, and setting up for Houndmaster next turn, too. And, yeah, and sure. setting up for Houndmaster, which is a pretty big deal. Which is, I imagine, what we'll probably see. And I wonder if Strife Crows continue to amplify that board presence with cards like Snake Trap, which is also, once again, coming back into popularity. I think it's one of those, you know, on-again, off-again type of relationships that you see on reality televisions or like the WB back in the day, Kibler, um, where you see like hunters with Snake Trap coming in and out. Uh, but I've been seeing it more recently, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Shrifeco has one of them in the deck here. I think that was actually uh, a WB uh, teen show, was Hunters with Snake Traps. That was... <laughs> it may have been I mean, after... It was, I think it was called Snake Trap Creek or something like that, but... That uh, does sound more like it. <laughs> so here, uh, this is actually kind of a tough spot for Orange. He's facing down what he imagines uh, is a freezing trap. Uh, and then he does have a quick shot he can use to take out this hmm. web spinner if he wants along with this animal companion but that's still not putting himself in a great spot and leok is the worst thing here it, yeah. it is a free kill for uh the houndmaster if it's able to stick around it is it is not it gets quick shot but this actually sets up either another houndmaster or potentially a kill command to protect the freezing trap for strife crow yeah, second Houndmaster is pretty devastating too. Again, it's the, the template you can gain on the board, and the fact is you still have a Freezing Trap up, so that Pilot Shredder is frozen until Unleash the Hound is drawn. Yep. And yeah, so we can see Orange, I think, is probably just going to want to kill Command to, to get things off this board. Otherwise, he's just getting hit. I mean, he could play Freezing Trap and kill Command. Uh, that's potentially reasonable. But what? right mm -hmm. now he can't. You know, he he knows the free time. He could just attack and replay, but that puts himself in an awkward spot too. You know, he yeah, because nine to the face, and that's right. what's gonna ha what's gonna happen to him. And this is gonna be particularly bad because Strife Car has the second freezing trap. Absolutely, that's the he, big he just uh, go thumping. nine to the face. Yeah, and with the juggler drawn too, the nine to the face hero power you leave freezing trap up. It, this is this is a disaster for Orange. He's got Dr. Boom next turn, too. That's three juggles plus game-ending damage. Assuming game doesn't end next turn from what's on board plus a kill command here. And what's so funny is that Orange has been defensive, but he's supposed to be the more aggressive one. That's what cars like drawing a double kill command, as much as people always roll their eyes at hunters have the second kill command in their hand early on. Uh, if it doesn't work out on the board early for them, it sometimes just falls completely flat. And we're seeing both kill commands have to come down defensively, which is really not what you want to be doing when you are playing the more aggressive hunter deck. You really want to be able to leverage those kill commands to just go to your opponent's face, uh, or at least to kill a minion to force your minions through. Here, he just double kill commanded, and is not even going to be able to attack. Oh, oh. juggle. <laughs> Speaking of disaster, the Leopard yeah. dies to juggler, which again preserves the freezing trap on Strife Crow's side against just a... Uh, a piloted shredder. Yep. 
I mean, it just it just continues to spell more and more you know, the errors I mean, against just... Orange's side here because he had another freezing trap too, and that's useless against the Yeah, and 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 Strife Pro wins in three straight games against Orange. That was a uh, pretty quick match. Yeah, really dominant performance from Strife Pro, and you can tell that uh, he was also trying to get that. Kind of over with because I think it's pretty early for him in uh, Santa Monica for sure. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it's single elimination from this point on, guys. So I think Strifeco is going to go ahead and play against Surrender. And if he wins against that, he plays the winner of Trump versus uh, whoever comes out of Forsen versus Toyota, which is our next match coming up here on stream. So a very quick match here for Orange. Uh, unfortunately, he's eliminated, but there is going to be more tournaments in the future, considering that he's been a regular in some of those tournaments as well. Uh, in the meantime, I guess we're going to be taking a break, Kibler. And when we come back, we're going to have more action here in the Vulcan Deck Masters Playoffs Day number two.